the catexis and virality of rough trade in Pablo Perez, un año sin amor, en el mendigo chupa pijas. <laughs> Whenever you want, John. Thank you. In this chapter, I examine the life narrative of an HIV positive hero named Pablo Perez, who appears in a series of three novels, Un Año Sin Amor, El Mendigo Chupapijas, and Querido Nicolás. Each text can be read as a standalone novel. The author uses the term self-referential to describe his work. They belong to a typology scholars call life writing. Pablo Perez is the author, the narrator, and the hero of the story in each of the novels. Since readers generally consider this coincidence and nomenclature as invoking what Philippe Lejeune on autobiography theorizes as the autobiographical pact, I argue that the most productive way of reading Perez's novels is through the lens of autofiction. Rather than consider the author an autobiographical narrator, I read him as Pablo Perez, an air quotes version of himself, loosely based on real life events. I also argue that Perez intellectually registers the zeitgeist of a specific historical moment in Argentina when an HIV positive gay man practicing radical sexuality known as gay leather sexuality to insiders of the gay leather style of sadomasochism confronts the existential angst and inner exile provoked by HIV AIDS. In 2005, the same year that the second novel, El Mendigo Chupapijas, was published nearly 10 years after the first, director Ana Berneri released a cinematic adaptation of the first two novels with the title Un Año Sin Amor. Paris shares screenplay writing credit with the director. Since the film tells a single story based on the first two novels, I decided it would be more interesting to read the life narrative of the protagonist across the span of all three novels, since such a reading would allow me to trace the arc of the character's development and transformation through a period of two decades. Although dated entries help us to organize major events in a timeline, some events cannot be situated chron chronologically as they reside in the fuzzy space time of memory narration, what Chilean writer Pedro Lemebel calls zigzagueo. All the novels begin in media res and contain numerous flashbacks by the ways and not to mentions in their semantic design, reflecting oblique, transversal, and nomadic forms of tracing back through time. Therefore, creating a linear temporal sequence of the complete story is complicated. Although there are moments of dialogical exchange with other characters expressed in quotations in all three novels, Pettis incorporates what Gerard Genet in The Architects calls transtextuality, the transcendence of the text, everything that brings it into relationship, manifest or hidden with other texts. Genet's proposal subsumes Julia Cristeva's concept of intertextuality, which refers to the shaping of the meaning of a text through semantic design and includes quotations, illusions, pl plagiarism, translation, pastiche, and parody. But it also includes metatextual connections with other works of literature, either through direct citation or of other novels or connections perceived by the reader who has prior knowledge of specific reference. Besides the obvious reference such as gay uh, leather sexuality and global AIDS pandemic, the development of the drug cocktail, what is known as triple therapy, Paris includes intertextual reference, such as Kafka's diary, Rimbaud, Baudelaire, and Ginsberg's poetry, Sogya Rinponche's Tibetan book of living and dying, along with lyrics from popular music, among other translated global, transglobal sources, to represent ideas he cannot, or feelings that are better expressed through the words of other authors and creators. Transtextuality provides us with different angular perspectives from which to apprehend the personality and the self the author constructs in the life narratives. Un año sin amor is formatted as a diary, which Perez narrates in first person through entries spanning a temporal period of 10 months, 
from February through December of 1996. The semantic design of El Mendigo Chupapijas, a sort of transversal continuation of the first novel, demonstrates a hybridity in its refusal to settle into a single narrative mode. The novel oscillates between first and third person narration while including diary entries, emails, notes, and poems. The narration even includes some surrealist dream sequences or hallucinations where Perez describes transcendental spiritual experiences and visions of supernatural beings. Querido Nicolás was published a decade after the second novel, and it operates as a flashback of the hero's life story told through letters of correspondence written in the years before returning to Buenos Aires from Europe, where he acquired HIV. With the inclusion of poetry, translation of local French idioms, lists, and sections of letters entirely in French, Querido Nicolás could superficially be compared to Severus Sardui's Cobra, at least in its refusal to completely surrender meaningful narrative sequences to the reader. Another transtextual aspect of the novels is the appearance of people appropriated from French arts and letters. For example, in Querido Nicolás, we learned that one of Perez's greatest ambitions is to collaborate with Severus Sardui, who died from AIDS-related complications in 1993. After many attempts, our hero eventually gains an audience with Sardui and meets with him several times. Sardui is impressed with one of Perez's prose poems. He suggests that Perez turn it into a novel and offers to be the editor. Perez is delighted until the project reaches a dead end when Sardui travels abroad with his partner who seeks treatment for cancer and no longer takes his calls. Another important person in Querido Nicolás is the radical queer film and video maker Leonard Socaz, who is also mentioned as a close friend from France who visits Perez in Buenos Aires in Un Año Sin Amor. In Mendigo Chupapijas, Lionel is transferred into Dr. Socaz, a BDSM dungeon master. Socaz collaborated on projects with Michel Foucault, Guy Hockenham, and uh, Hervé Joubert who were all BDSM fetishists and died from AIDS-related complications. The letters to Nicolas also include references to Roland Barthes, Copi, someone named Giles, perhaps a nod to Deleuze, and many other people identified only by first names that echo other known thinkers. By including these references in his correspondence, Paris conveys the sense that he is among kindred spirits, those who share his passions, including the suffering and pain produced by the confrontation with HIV AIDS. In the letter dated Paris, September 30th, 1990, in Querido Nicolás, we learned that Paris is not surprised that he tests positive for HIV and that in Argentina, someone with the status is called cero positivo o portador. At that point in time, he hoped that the progression of his HIV infection would last many years without manifesting any symptoms. He reassures himself and his friend that se puede vivir hasta los ochenta y morir de viejo siendo cero positivo. Although he recognizes that um, his life has been forever transformed now that he is like a carrier of death, the shock of the news makes him realize that he also carries a tremendous responsibility because his body is like a dangerous bomb that could damage others or himself. He must practice safer sex and use condoms. In Un Año Sin Amor, the cautious optimism turns into exasperation in the diary entry dated February 1996, where the hope for a long incubation period and survival into old age gives way to talk about a race against time. If he could just hold on, he refers to the virus as a pharmacon, a deadly poison his body distills. The reality of death becomes palpable. Estamos en carrera y hay que aguantar. Estamos en carrera y hay que aguantar, he repeats to himself. Pero este veneno que fabrica mi cuerpo día a día me está culmando hasta que tal vez un día estalle. Vivo en un mundo en el que cada vez más los padres entierran a los hijos. Bella, Paula, Bernard, Vladimir, Hervé, por citar solamente a los que más quise y por orden de desaparición. In the Argentine context, the use of the word disappearance to describe the deaths is an interesting choice given the history of the military, military dictatorship. Paris went to France to master the language and hoped to launch his career as a writer and poet. 
He lived a bohemian lifestyle and became involved with a man named Hervé, who was HIV positive. Perez was devastated when Hervé was diagnosed with AIDS, decided to end all treatment and allowed himself to die. In the early 1990s, there were only two drugs available for treating HIV, AZT approved in, 97, in 87 and DDI approved in 91. Both drugs were toxic and had major side effects for patients. The drugs only became available to people with AIDS after LGBT activist groups from ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power in New York and Paris, applied an unprecedented amount of pressure on the United States and France to do something in the face of so much death. When Paris returned to Buenos Aires in the mid-1990s with the country in a neoliberal economic crisis, he tried to earn a living teaching French. He also began, began translating Hervé's diaries into Spanish. In the same diary entry of February 19th in Un Año Sin Amor, Paris writes, Leí algunos días, hace algunos días, el diario de Hervé, en el que dice que se sienta a escribir para dejar de dar vueltas por su casa como un león enjaulado. Eso mismo acabo de sentir. Me di cuenta de que estaba dando vueltas en bolas por toda la casa. Desnudo para que mi inglés recibe aire. Tengo una micosis de segundo grado. Naming his ex-lover Hervé in the novel creates a transtextual connection with the diary of Hervé Joubert in 1990 with the title To the Friend Who Did Not Save My Life. Joubert's novel scandalized French society with the revelation that Michel Foucault, who appears in, as a character named Musel, was a leather master and died from AIDS-related complications. In a nod to Joubert, Paris introduces what I call a contagious metaphor, León Enjaulado, to signify several things that exert influence on his life. The most powerful meaning is manifest when he feels like the effects of HIV infection are closing in on him like a cage. The protagonist realizes his radical sexuality has a beastly nature like that of a lion. When his animal nature becomes too much to contain, he ventures out in search of prey. The pleasure he derives from rapacious and insatiable sexual encounters with other men are life-affirming. El orgasmo me remite a una sensación de vida. Siempre me sentí medio muerto y cada orgasmo es para mí como un golpe eléctrico que me revive un poco, aunque sea por unos minutos, como un rayo que me trae de la muerte a la vida. If he is not able to make a connection with men through classified ads in the local LGBTQ magazine, he seeks them out at pornographic movie theaters, bars, restrooms, transit stations, and alleyways on the streets to derive visceral satisfaction for his animalistic urges, or as Paris puts it, llevado a la acción por el puro salvajismo que me caracteriza. Every time he leaves the safety of his home, he risks being arrested for his homosexual behavior. Moreover, his HIV infection increasingly affects his ability to breathe. The difficulty breathing transforms his body yet into another cage that chokes his existence. Hace dos semanas que me siento muy débil y que respiro mal. No sé si aguantaré mucho más sintiéndome así, preso de mi cuerpo. Throughout much of the first novel, our hero lives with the constant feeling that he will die before the end of the year. The HIV infection, along with the medications he takes, are even more cages that enclose him in inner exile. Creo que tomar el ACT y DDI hace que el SIDA esté más presente un, en todo momento, que no pueda olvidarme de mi enfermedad. Me siento feo y enfermo, encerrado en mí mismo, siempre con la idea de que voy a morir pronto, casi un deseo de morir. Preferiblemente, preferiblemente sin una intervención mía, aunque empiece a aparecer más seguido la idea de suicidio. As I see it, suicide is not a real option for Perez because despite the sensation of imminent death, our hero loves life. He relentlessly seeks out orgasmic encounters to continue feeling alive. Although his radical sexuality be began before he became HIV positive, it drifts towards gay leather sexuality after receiving the positive test results in Paris. His indulgence in sadomasochism and its contagious metaphors increased. The exposure fueled fantasies which began in childhood. 
It is not exactly clear when he fully embraced the fetishes he indulges, but in the old guard of gay leather sadomasochism, which began in the 1950s, slaves and masters were ritually trained and initiated. Perez became involved with a well-equipped leather master named Comisario Pablo Valles, sometimes between the end of Querido Nicolás and the beginning of Un Año Sin Amor. It is my contention and argument that Perez underwent what I call a disidentified initiation, one carried out by a gay leather sadomasochist clone practicing a rough trade detached from old guard traditions. Thank you very much. <laughs>